Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture, which is co-sponsored by the Center for International and Comparative Law and the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. Uh, the lecture will focus on power shifts in international law, structural realignment, and substantive pluralism that includes, but not is not limited to, the BRICS, uh, which, if you don't know what that term is, you soon will. Uh, and the person who will be presenting the lecture to us is uh, a longstanding friend and colleague, Professor Bill Burke White from uh, the University of Pennsylvania, where he holds more titles at the moment than I think I can fit into uh, this introduction. And so I'll simply say that Bill is really uh, exceptionally well placed to uh, deliver uh, this talk to us today. Uh, in the sense that he has uh, trained as an international lawyer, international legal scholar, also trained uh, in political science, specifically international relations theory. He has published widely across the length and breadth of international law, uh, focusing on issues including human rights, international investment law, uh, international criminal law, post-conflict justice, uh, and a range of other topics relating to international institutions and governance. He's also spent several years uh, in the Obama administration for the uh, policy planning staff of then uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, State Department. So I think this will be a really terrific opportunity to learn about how international law and institutions are being reshaped by power realignments that are occurring around the world that all of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with. So uh, the format will be that uh, Professor Burke White will speak for about half an hour or so, uh, and then he will open it up to questions. So please do uh, formulate those, have them ready. And please join me in welcoming Bill Burke White to Duke. Thanks, thanks, Larry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks you all for coming. I'll try to uh, entertain you so that uh, you're not just getting a free burrito for being here. Um, let me first say that uh, I'm just thrilled to be at Duke. This is a school that I am envious of every single day because of the international law faculty that you have uh, here, and, and uh, you know many of whom are in the front row or in the front two rows at the moment. Uh, you just have an amazing international law program, and I'm delighted to, to come down. Um, as Larry said, we're going to talk today about the BRICS and their impact on the international legal system. But I think I actually have to start by taking you back to my first day at the State Department in March 2009. And I walked in uh, to my first meeting with Secretary Clinton, and she said, write me a memo on the future of the international order and global governance. What will be the driving group of states that solves the governance challenges that face us today? And I walked out and said, oh my god, how am I going to write this memo? There's no answer to this question. And in fact, the memo that I ultimately wrote was titled the G hyphen X. X because we didn't know what the number would be. Would it be the traditional G7 or G8? Would it be a G13 that added perhaps you know, India and Brazil to the mix? Would it be a G20 or even a G32? And there really was no clear answer at that point to how the international system uh, would be uh, effectively governed. Um, I then uh, spent about you know, five or six months at the State Department, and suddenly we were on our way to Pittsburgh, uh, where in the 2009 Pittsburgh summit, uh, in, uh, President Obama and the G20 leaders declared the G20 to be the premier forum for international economic cooperation. And it seemed for a moment like we had an answer to the question. The answer was that there were now 20 states that if you got them together could design economic stimulus and relief packages that pretty effectively dealt with the financial crisis that was then uh, going on. But it was only a few months later that we were preparing Secretary Clinton to fly off uh, to the um, uh, Copenhagen climate change negotiation. And suddenly, we no longer had a group of 20 states in the room. We had a group of about 190 states in the room, and nothing got done. And President Obama, on the last day of the summit, found himself walking in, perhaps uninvited or perhaps late, to a meeting uh, of Premier uh, Wen, uh, Prime Minister Singh, President Lula, and President Zuma. And it was only in that group of five heads of state that you could reach even as thin an agreement as the Copenhagen Climate Accord. So suddenly our group of 20 as the answer seemed to be being replaced by a new group of five 
somehow embedded in the UNFCCC, the United Nations broader group of states working on climate change. So I left those set of incidents still without a good answer to what the governance structure of the international order might look like going forward. And I'll admit, I spent the next two years at the State Department never finding an answer for it, and ultimately said, as soon as I get back to academe, I actually want to think about this from an academic perspective. And in many ways, today's talk and this paper have to be understood as my best at, uh, effort to answer uh, that question. But where does this fit within international law itself? It fits, I think, by starting to understand the last 50 years of international legal scholarship, at least in some ways, as a response to Hans Morgenthau's critique of international law after World War II, a critique that essentially said uh, international law uh, is an epiphenomenon of power uh, and essentially irrelevant. Power will dictate outcomes. Uh, and that's a gross oversimplification, but for our purposes, I'll leave it at that. But what most international lawyers have done, and two of the most prominent of the era, Anne-Marie Slaughter and Harold Coe on the screen, spent most of their career trying to prove in one way or another that international law could in fact constrain and shape state behavior. Um, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm actually interested in the question of how power and different distributions of power shape international law and international legal norms. So attempting to sort of come back to a conversation that we ignored for most of the last 50 years to really say, when we leave a unipolar world where the US was really the one power in the international system and enter into some different system structure, what does that mean for the, functioning, the functions of international law and the substantive norms of the international legal system? Um, and I think it's fair to say that today's modern international legal system can really be understood as a construct of the United States since 1945. Um, Sure, I'll throw in uh, the UN having a role, Europe having a role, but essentially uh, the norms of today's international legal system uh, are the product of that uh, unipolar era, um, and they are largely Lockean in nature. Lockean in nature in the sense that they are often about the protection of individual rights and freedoms uh, and ensuring those, whether through human rights law, international investment law, or many of the other uh, uh, subsystems uh, within the international legal system. And again, that's an oversimplification. You'll be able to find places where international law points in different directions. But for broad strokes, uh, I think that's fair to say. So what is... Uh, there we go. What's happening uh, in the international political order that we can try to use to understand what's happening in the international legal order? So if you go back um, 15 years, Goldman Sachs coins the term uh, BRIC and says that Brazil, Russia, India, and China will overtake the United States and the G6 by 2040. And this is their original uh, chart of that. And guess what? They got it wrong. China and the BRICS will overtake the United States and uh, the G6 a lot sooner than 2040. Uh, China uh, has now surpassed uh, all but the United States in its GDP. Um, uh, and if you look at some of the other BRICS, India, Russia, and Brazil, uh, this shows you where they were in 2002. This is where they are in 2012. And what you've seen is an extraordinarily rapid economic growth uh, displacing uh, much of Europe uh, and uh, in, at least in the case of China, uh, Japan, and Germany. Uh, and depending on what forecast you use, China will uh, eclipse the United States sometime in the next decade, presumably. Um, that's the economic story. But that's not the only story that we need to look at. That is, in fact, the story that most people look at when they look at sort of where the international order is headed. I think we also have to look at two other dimensions of power, one being military power, the other being soft power. What's interesting is that the story of military power actually looks quite different than what we see in the story of economic power. And that is that the United States has remained the world's strongest military. In fact, the United States outspends, oops, I thought I had another graphic up there, outspends all other countries in the world combined in its military expenditures, and is still the only country that is able to effectively deploy power anywhere in the world at once uh, through its Navy, aircraft carriers, and otherwise. Um, yes, China is spending 
spending more on its military, uh, but China in no way can rival the United States. And in fact, it's not China, it's Russia today that is still the second most powerful military in the world in terms of its ability to assert power uh, elsewhere. Uh, so unlike the economic story, where we've seen the BRICs rapidly advance, in military power, we've seen uh, some greater continuity. What about soft power? China, the world's you know, soon-to-be biggest economy, attempted this kind of soft power uh, charm offensive, it was called, where China ran around the world spending money painting Africa with the Chinese flag, uh, and it seemed that China was on a soft power kick, and perhaps you add that to its military power, we might see the emergence of a sort of Chinese-led order. Well, it turns out that that effort uh, well, I should say one of the things. So, to some degree, has uh, Brazil, under President Lula, uh, handing out cash around Africa uh, and in South America. Um, but to some degree, those orders have backfired um, in that China's charm offensive has not been well received. In fact, there's been a backlash against China in Africa. Uh, Brazil is facing a corruption scandal at the moment, the likes of which that might actually bring down the Brazilian government. And it's not China or Brazil. Um, it's, in fact, to some degree, the United States that still maintains an extraordinary soft power uh, ability, as well as several European states. I don't have the picture up there, but you can imagine when Germany wins the World Cup uh, or uh, the UK hosts the Olympics, uh, those countries have a soft power that has not been rivaled. And in fact, even among the BRICs themselves, it's not Brazil, excuse me, it's not China and Russia that have increased their soft power. It's Brazil and India to some degree. Uh, Brazil through the World Cup and the Olympics, India through in part its English language ability and its de democracy, uh, whereas China and Russia have actually lost soft power ability. After Russia's uh, uh, efforts last year in Ukraine, uh, everyone in the region is afraid rather than welcoming them. So what we're seeing is, in fact, some much more nuanced changes in global power structures than we might have thought. Um, I frame them in this paper as power diffusion, power disaggregation, and issue-specific issue power asymmetries. What do I mean by that? I mean that, first, power is becoming much more diffuse. It's not simply that U.S. power is shifting to China. It's that a far larger number of states are able to influence the international system, sometimes relying on their economic power, sometimes on their military power, sometimes on their soft power. Similarly, power is becoming disaggregated in that different countries hold different relative advantages. Those countries that are economically strong may not always be militarily strong. Those countries that have strong amounts of soft power may not have great amounts of economic power or military power. So it's in some ways, I think, a much more flexible and fluid system, and one where on every issue, one has to look and see which states have the power to influence the system on that issue. In an issue of international trade, China's economy is absolutely going to matter. But on an issue of international uh, human rights, India's soft power might actually be able to shape the system. So I paint this world that I call a multi-hub structure. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that, and then I want to turn to some substantive areas where I think we're starting to see this multi-hub structure uh, in action. What does it mean to say it's a multi-hub structure? I would argue that there is no single state today with the ability to lead on every issue. The United States can no longer do so, but it's not like China has suddenly stepped in and is able to lead or even willing to lead uh, on uh, most uh, issues. Power is diffuse. There's far more players today that matter in any international negotiation or legal process than there would have been 10, 20, or even 50 years ago. There's a wide range of states that can decide, and I use the word decide in, in an important way, which is that states have to decide to assume leadership. But there's lots of states with the power capacities to assume leadership in the international order, and I'll give you some examples in a minute. And all of that means that the international system, I would argue, operates much more on the basis of a variable geometry. Different states will come together around different issues to drive international legal processes forward. And you'll have very different constellations of states, so variable geometry um, around those issues. And I use this Rubik's cube. I, in fact, think that the uh, advertisement poster for the talk today uh, might be a better image than, than my Rubik's cube. Uh, now, this structure is very different than what we've seen before. The last uh, 
Most of the last 50 years were dominated by a bipolar structure. The US or the USSR had to sort of be at the table and one or the other of them had to be a leader on most issues. And most other states in the system were locked in to following them, either through treaty alliances, through necessary side payments that had been negotiated, uh, or through fear of military aggression. So too is this different than a, a, a unipolar order where the United States, and again, I'll throw Europe in there. Sorry, Ralph, forgive me. Um, but I'll throw Europe in as, as, as along with the United States had uh, to really lead the system. Perhaps this looks most like a multipolar uh, order uh, that you might have seen after the Concert of Europe. But I want to suggest that it's different in some important ways. First of all, the multipolar order that came out of the Concert of Europe was really one in which there were a set number of potential leading states. They were, in fact, written into the treaty. Um, in the multi-hub system we're seeing today, Lots more countries are capable of leadership. Lots more countries are capable of saying, I care about climate change and I want to try to advance an agenda here. Similarly, states have much more flexibility in terms of when and whether to follow a leading state. Uh, in the Concert of Europe, the non-leading states were more or less locked in a somewhat subordinate relationship to those leading states. Whereas in the multi-hub system today, I would argue, there's a lot of fluid flexibility to choose when and whether to follow. And I'll give you uh, several uh, examples of that diversified leadership and increased pluralism. You might think that you have to be a big, powerful state in order to lead. This is the Maldives government meeting underwater on a climate change issue. And I would argue that today, the Maldives is actually able to play a leading role, obviously not a definitive role, but a leading role, a convening role on some climate change issues, because it has a soft power that comes from the threat of that happening. Similarly, uh, you see countries like Canada assuming a leading role on banning landmines. You see South Korea taking a leading role in the shaping of the G20. How? Not by asserting military power, but some mix of soft power, military power, and economic power, and a willingness to lead, a willingness to host any meeting, a willingness to start new tracks within the G20. Um, a country like South Africa, able to take a lead on the interpretation of certain particularly uh, social and cultural rights norms, through its soft power, through its ability uh, to interpret those norms and willingness to interpret them in its constitutional uh, court. Or a country like little Luxembourg, able to take a lead around several issues of international criminal law because it has focused almost all of its very limited foreign policy capacity around international criminal law. Again, hosting meetings, playing a key role in the assembly of states' parties. Um, I use some of these as extreme examples, but to do so to say you don't have to be a brick to necessarily lead. You don't have to be the US uh, or China to do so um, in this system. We also see real shifts in the structure of leadership in the international order. One example of that comes from bilateral investment treaties. Tradition, these are the treaties, for those who don't know, that protect foreign investors. Uh, who, an American who wants to invest in Argentina is protected by the bilateral investment treaty. And traditionally, these treaties were negotiated by capital exporting states that were sort of the rich Germany's, United States, et cetera. It would go to a country like Argentina and say, here, sign our treaty if you want investment. That's been flipped on its head. Today, countries like India, China, all have their own model bilateral investment treaties. And when they go into a negotiation, they say, here's our model. Let's negotiate off that. You also see far more South-South bilateral investment treaties. Countries like India entering into an investment treaty uh, with its neighbors, or uh, well, not Brazil has stayed out of it, uh, but the South negotiating with other Southern countries rather than this being imposed from the top down. Power in that system has started to flip. Um, ugh. Well, let's go back a few here, sorry. Uh, where was I? I don't know how that. Oh, you're getting a backwards preview. Uh, here we go. Um, you also see within this structure emerging substantive pluralism. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's a lot more room in the international legal order for multiple viewpoints to be advanced by different states. I would argue that during the period of American hegemony or bi bipolar era of US and Russian hegemony, 
alternate viewpoints were largely frozen out. Occasionally, like with the new economic order, they would percolate up for a moment and be stamped out pretty quickly. And what we see today is that on lots of issues, uh, there are competing viewpoints that are allowed in the international system. And in fact, there's often indeterminacy between those viewpoints. Here's one example. China and the United States are advancing very different visions for trade in the Asia Pacific region. Here's the Trans-Pacific Partnership with Barack Obama at the center. Here is the Regional Comprehensive and Economic Partnership uh, with uh, China and uh, its uh, ASEAN neighbors uh, at the center. What's important to recognize is there's two very different visions of free trade lurking in this. The TPP is a much deeper commitment and has a much deeper set of structural changes necessary in your economy to be part of it than does the RCEP. Two different visions of what trade might look like. I don't have the picture up here, but I'll give you one other fun example, which comes from the area of the law of the sea. The US and China have a fundamental disagreement about what is allowed in another country's exclusive economic zone, that zone 200 miles off the coast. Uh, are you allowed to have a, a naval vessel pass through there for purposes of observing uh, the seabed or observing the activities of the coastal state? The US view has traditionally been yes. The Chinese view has long been no. But until about five or 10 years ago, the US could essentially assert that view by simply policing the seas as it chose. Today, every time the US does that, it runs the risk that China is going to assert its views back. So we have much more substantive pluralism. And I think you can see this across a wide range of fields of international law. And I'll, when we turn to some specific areas, I think you'll see that. The other big change beyond this increasing substantive pluralism that we see in the multi-hub system is um, a move from the global to the regional. In short, it has become increasingly difficult for international legal processes to operate in a truly global way. And more and more often, they're happening regionally or in subsystems that cut across regions. Part of that comes from the sheer number of states that have to be in the room to get something done. It's a lot harder to negotiate a trade agreement with 153 states than with 50 states. It's almost impossible to negotiate a climate change agreement with 193 states. It also flows from the fact that more of those 150 states are actually powerful enough to matter. And I know in the international legal system, technically one state one vote, but in reality, different states have different influence in the system, and today, more states matter. And that makes it harder and harder to solve the coordination challenge, because almost all international legal processes are in some form a coordination game at the global level than at the regional level. And you've seen a decline of global hegemons like the United States that could often assume the, the political and power costs of that coordination game. And what you see in their place is often regional hegemons like China or India that are able to assume those costs and drive forward a, pro a legal process at the regional level. Um, I, I'm actually going to move us from structure now to substance. So structurally, we've seen increasing pluralism and a move toward the regional or subsystemic level. But what's happening substantively? I want to look at three areas of international law where I would argue that we're beginning to see that substantive pluralism emerge and substantive tensions form between essentially the US built order and rising powers. The first of those is sovereignty, the second is legitimacy, and the third is the role of the state in economic development. So let's start with sovereignty. Um, I would argue, and again, this is a, tr a tricky paper because I'm making some big generalizations across big areas in limited time, but I would argue that what we have seen in the last you know, two decades of US leadership, or 50 years if you want to include uh, the Cold War era, is a growing permeability of sovereignty. The idea that a country might have a right to intervene in another country based on a human rights concern, or uh, that there might be an imperative to deal with transnational border challenges uh, by actually uh, acting within another country. Um, we see that at the Security Council with a much more willingness of the Security Council to deem domestic issues threats to international peace and security. We see it uh, with 
things like the International Criminal Court uh, stepping in uh, and assuming jurisdiction in various countries. We see it in places like Kosovo, where the United States and NATO chose to intervene, uh, notwithstanding uh, a lack of Security Council authorization to do so. Uh, and we see it with doctrines like the emerging responsibility to protect, which while not formally authorizing activity beyond the Security Council, does think about sovereignty in a far more permeable way. I want to argue that that permeable view of sovereignty comes in stark contrast to the view of sovereignty being asserted by many of the BRICs. And to understand that, let's look at both Russia and China. Russia's view of sovereignty, souveraineté, um, is a much more uh, definitive, firm view of sovereignty. There is, in fact, no room for permeability within it. Now, you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about Crimea? And my answer to you is Russia justifies what it did in Crimea as fully consistent with its sovereignty because it says those were, in fact, either Russian citizens or Russian compatriots who fall within its vision of what Russian sovereignty is. Um, if you look at the Russian national security strategy, attempts to belittle the role of a sovereign state as the fundamental element of international relations generate a threat of arbitrary interference in international affairs. Um, no fewer than 13 times in the 2012 Russian national security strategy uh, does the idea of sovereignty come up. Um, the number one goal of that strategy is to prevent the responsibility to protect from becoming a rule of international law. So too, and again, you know, here I'm being a terrible comparativist. Uh, I'm doing countries in, in two sentences. The paper, I try to do it deeper. Um, but take a look at China's version of sovereignty, Zhu Quan stems in some ways from the five principles of peaceful coexistence, mutual respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty, mutual non-aggression. Hu Jintao in 2008 says, we should always put the nation's sovereignty and security above anything else. I just came back from a set of interviews in China last week. Haven't built them into the paper yet, uh, but conversations with the legal advisor to China's foreign ministry uh, reasserted this. We're, very, we're still very worried about responsibility to protect. Uh, we're very worried about interferences in sovereignty. Why? Perhaps because of Taiwan, perhaps because of Tibet, uh, but a much more firm view uh, of sovereignty. What's interesting is that China and Russia have attracted followers to this view. And some of those followers involve, oh, I'm skipping a long here, head without noticing. Uh, you see this in Syria. I think you all know the Syria story, but China and Russia vetoing uh, any action uh, in Syria um, for a long time. Um, it is in Russia and China, again, it is unacceptable that military interventions and other forms of interference, which undermine the foundations of international law based on the principle of sovereign equality, be carried out on the pretext of the responsibility to protect this effort to undermine R2P. China, perhaps a little more flexible, massive humanitarian crises are a legitimate concern of the international community, but international action should be limited to efforts to defuse the crisis, not to intervene. Um, there's their vote on Syria. But this is where I was trying to get, which is that followers have been attracted. Brazil comes out with a vision of R2P that it refers to as responsibility while protecting. What's interesting is when you dig into responsibility while protecting, it's not about a responsibility to protect at all. It's about a set of limitations and safeguards to prevent interference by foreign countries in another's human rights crisis. Um, and that is something that Brazil, uh, both under Lula and Dilma, have championed. Um, South Africa voted in favor uh, of the Libya intervention. But going down and talking to the South Africans a year or two after Libya, suddenly they said, no, 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 that's not what our vision of R2P was all about. Uh, stepping back from it, following under the Chinese and Russian vision of a more absolutist sovereignty. What does this suggest? I think it suggests that going forward, we're going to continue to see a fight over how permeable sovereignty ought to be in international law um, at points like do we establish new human rights tribunals? 
Should international criminal accountability extend to international uh, courts and international mechanisms? Should we allow extradition? How do we think about sovereignty in the air, in the law, over the law of the sea? Russia and China have been much more assertive about natural resources and protecting, uh, again, within that EEZ. And even to some degree in international investment law, way out of the human rights space, but an area where countries such as Russia and China want to make sure they have somewhat more uh, protective uh, space uh, and greater sense of sovereignty. Um, Jumping along, let's talk a bit about, um, oh, we already saw that, legitimacy. Um, what do I mean by legitimacy? This is tricky because it's not quite a legal doctrine, but the idea that I'm trying to get at here is when are international legal processes and institutions deemed fair and legitimate? And again, in somewhat of a simplified version, I want to suggest that for the United States in the last 10 or 20 years, the preference has been for output legitimacy. What we cared about was did the institution get the job done, and we would design the institution to maximize its effectiveness. Oftentimes, that would mean a smaller grouping, uh, a more limited format, a more flexible, perhaps not legally grounded format. Um, in contrast to what you might think of as input legitimacy, input legitimacy turning on Who's in the meeting? Who's in the room? And what's the formal legal basis of authority that that institution has? And I would argue that in contrast to the US preference for output legitimacy, a number of rising powers significantly preference input legitimacy. Um, the US's output legitimacy is seen, whether it's in meetings of the G7, then G8, in coalitions of the willing, like you see in Iraq, uh, or even uh, in questions of do you deal with climate change uh, through a group of powerful economies rather than through a broad format? Do you host a nuclear security summit where you can decide whom to invite based on who you want to have in the room rather than saying we're going to invite all states that meet certain criteria or all states um, collectively? Brazil thinks about the world fundamentally differently. President Lula makes clear time and time again during his presidency that international institutions and processes should be structured around input legitimacy. We have a major concern that new organizations of global governance, he says, do not replicate the unrepresentativeness of the past. There wasn't a speech he gave at the General Assembly where he didn't demand a seat at the table. Um, similarly, India. Uh, preferences this vision of input legitimacy. Indian government officials talk about playing by the rules, giving greater attention to participatory and accountability legitimacy. Some of this may flow from historical legacies, from colonialism, um, from the non-aligned movement, the G77. Um, I'm not trying in this paper to explain the origin of these preferences, but I think the preferences are clear. So where do we see this play out? One answer is the establishment of new international organizations that, in whatever way those countries define input legitimacy, are deemed more legitimate. The BRICS uh, grouping, the new BRICS bank, among other institutions, being an example of that. Of course, you see it in demands by countries like India and Brazil for a seat at the Security Council. Um, you see it in climate change, where India and Brazil have been much more focused on working in the that's missing an F, sorry, the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the entire UN framework rather than the smaller MEF. Um, you can see it in the emergence of regional versus global trade regimes. Brazil has been become recently a strong proponent of the reinvigoration of Mercosul or Mercosur, the Southern Cone Trade Agreement, um, as opposed to as focused on uh, you know, WTO uh, Doha round negotiations. Um, in the Indian version, I'm, something's a little wrong there with that flag. If new powers are to be, effective, to be accommodated effectively in international institutions, considerably more attention will have to be devoted to how their notions of fairness and legitimacy differ from those currently embedded in the rules of international law. But the place that I think this is most surprising um, is, in fact, in the engagement of these countries with the G20. Why? Because what you would expect is that these countries would be thrilled to be in the G20. They've now got a seat at the table. And you'd think that they would say, 
Let's expand the G20 because, hey, we've got a seat at the table here and we're getting nowhere at the Security Council. But that's not what's happened. What you've actually seen is Brazil and India, among others, question the legitimacy of the G20. Say, OK, on the international economic crisis, that's fine. But we don't want to deal with anything political at the G20. If Obama wants to talk about Syria or Iraq at the G20, we're going to be uh, across the building, nowhere near that discussion. If you want to create uh, a new development track within the G20, we're not very excited about it, and we're actually going to push back on that because the institution is neither legitimate in terms of its membership, nor is it based on a kind of formal legal structure that gives it uh, a sense of, of legal legitimacy uh, in its creation. Let me touch on the third area where I think we're seeing a tension emerge, and that's the role of the state in international economic development. And again, here's my generalization, which is to say that most of the US efforts to shape the international economic law regime over the last several decades um, have been focused on what you might call the Washington Consensus, largely liberalization of trade and investment, fiscal discipline, privatization and deregulation, keep the state out of the economy, and embed those rules in our trade and investment uh, embed those norms in our trade and investment rules. Um, I would argue that many of the BRICs see a fundamentally different role for the state in the international economic order. Um, where did my, um, I don't want to necessarily call it a Beijing consensus, because I'm not sure it actually stems from Beijing, but it's a view that puts the state much more formally in the economic system as a guardian of the economy and as often a redistributor of wealth. Take, for example, Brazil's new state activism. Um, <coughs> the uh, Lula and Dilma regimes have launched a series of fiscal transfer systems, essentially, uh, that are largely or at least potentially in violation of trade law uh, in some aspects. Brazil Maior, Bolsa Familia, Brazil, Sem, Brazil Sem Miseria, that are about giving money and often food uh, to poorer communities in Brazil. Um, that is a long way from the Washington consensus. You also see it in India. Um, India's 2013 food security law, um, presumed probably in violation of WTO uh, rules. Um, India's basic purpose of its five -year, current five-year economic plan is about broad-based and inclusive growth to reduce poverty. And India often will talk about the government's role in ensuring those steps are met. That's a long way from the Washington consensus that we uh, have advocated. And we see this tension uh, also in China. And China's a much more complicated picture. But the 12 five-year plan talks about the fundamental end of economic transformation is to improve people's lives, stepping up reform of the income redistribution system. Um, and if you take China, India, and Brazil together, you start to see uh, interesting changes uh, in various aspects of international economic law. Start with Brazil and its lack of engagement in the international investment law system. Brazil never entered into a single bilateral investment treaty, which was sort of the fundamental way you advance your economic growth if you were a Latin American country uh, from 1990 on. Brazil stayed out. Why? And if you look at the parliamentary debates in Brazil around the, rat the, non the decision not to ratify several treaties that were submitted, it was because of there was a fear that those treaties would prevent the Brazilian government from being able to protect its people from foreign uh, interference. Um, and what's interesting is that other countries have now started to follow Brazil. You're seeing South, some South American countries either uh, exit the ICSID system altogether or at least reshape their bilateral investment treaties in a far more protectionist way. Um, you're starting to see changes in model bilateral investment treaties across the board. China is the hardest picture here. It's complicated because it's gone through three different eras, but China initially was in many ways, along with Brazil, a leader in saying we want to very much limit what promises we make to foreign investors. They did it by saying you can sue us, you can bring an arbitration against us based on a question of liability, but not uh, an amount of liability, but not actually uh, whether there was any wrongdoing under it. We have to admit that first. China has subsequently become more liberal. But India has just released a new model bilateral investment treaty, one that is much more restrictive uh, and provides much more room for state protection. Russia's 
never has really liberalized. And even the United States' new model has moved in that direction somewhat. Um, but uh, where that, I think, suggests is that you're seeing a kind of new equipoise, a new balance point in investment law that has brought those views of the BRICS uh, more centrally. And you're going to see a far less, uh, more protectionist or less investor-friendly investment law regime. What about in uh, trade law? One of the areas where you're seeing this is in compulsory licensing under TRIPS. Uh, TRIPS has been largely about um, intellectual property protection. Uh, the Doha Declaration, of course, says that that intellectual property protection should be interpreted uh, in light of promoting access to medicines for all. But what we've now seen is India being much more willing to grant compulsory licenses um, that essentially uh, are Compulsory licenses are allowed under TRIPS, but to go much further uh, than TRIPS probably does uh, and uh, push that regime in a more um, uh, human-friendly rather than uh, um, uh, intellectual property-friendly dimension. Uh, and you've also seen South Africa take similar moves uh, in its own court system. So I think there's another point where a very different view of what the purpose of the state is in the international uh, economic regime uh, comes through. Um, you also see it with respect to Brazil, uh, India's food security law. Um, India has also taken the leadership uh, in, in fact, reworking in intellectual property protections um, where uh, disabled persons, and particularly the blind, are at stake, drafting a new treaty, calling together uh, the countries around uh, a, new, uh, a new treaty to provide limitations on or exceptions to intellectual property protections to give access to the blind. Um, and in some other areas like aircraft financing, trying to actually take aircraft financing out of the WTO regime into a more political forum, the OECD, uh, in an effort uh, to provide more state subsidies by Brazil uh, to uh, Embraer. Um, so I know I've run over, and I want to wrap up there by, uh, with two concluding ideas. The first is to say I actually think what we're seeing is a rebalancing of the international, economic, uh, international legal order closer to the Westphalian state system where we started, a world where there are, this is a system of states and about states that may not embody some of the Lockean norms the United States put into the system, uh, but that is fundamentally about protecting states and advancing state interests. Um, I also want to suggest that this story is often one that is seen as bad for the United States, that this is about the end of the US dominance of the international legal system, and we will be far less able to achieve our objectives in international law. And I want to say that that may be wrong, and here's why. Um, the US has always liked to operate through smaller variable geometries, smaller groups of states that you can bring together around an issue. It was hard for us to do that because we would be told, well, you're not working with informal uh, big group international legal institutions. But I would argue in a multi-hub system, most international legal processes are going to occur within that kind of variable geometry. And the US has always been good at that and will be continue to be good at it. Secondly, the United States has never liked to be constrained very much by international law at all. It used to be that we might be able to help define what those rules were, but we still didn't want to be constrained. I think we're entering an era where rules will be much less determinate. It will be much harder to say that this is what a rule is. See Russia's interpretation of what happened in Crimea versus the US interpretation. I can't tell you which is actually right. I can tell you which I think is right. See China's debate with the United States about what happens in the EEZ. I think we're losing determinacy. And that may actually be better for the United States because we can simply argue for a different definition of the legal rule and perhaps be less constrained. So I want to conclude by saying, sure, it may be worse if you're a human rights activist, and you may need to operate differently if you're sitting in the legal advisor's office at the State Department, but I think that there are still ways that the United States can be very effective, even in a multi-hub system where the BRICs are putting pressure on and putting tension with uh, the existing norms of the system. So let me stop there and say thanks very much for listening, and sorry for going on for quite so long. Sure. sure. You get to start, and that'll kick it off, and then I'll get a student in the back right. on the second one. So thank you for the presentation. That was really interesting. So I would, I, since you put Morgenthau in this fabulous cigar up on one of your first yep. slides, let me pretend I will channel him yep. um, and say, 
how much of this is actually cultural or something new as you're portraying it? How much of it is just structure, right? So as we expect China maybe more than the other BRICS to really become a dominant player, yep. no longer simply an emerging player, how much will their preferences change? So a lot of the preferences that you're espousing have been like, I want really strong sovereignty, mm -hmm. fear of being invaded, yep. want to be left alone. But maybe China now says, Hmm, you know, yeah. less concerned about that. So how much do you expect that this is actually something that is inherent in their place in the system and this China's uh, preferences will change, we expect, in years to come? And how much is something really cultural from within the state? Right, so there's, there's a couple different pieces in there I want to address. First, let me take the, the Morgenthau piece and, and push back on one aspect of that, which is that Morgenthau says that when there is a fundamental redistribution of power in the system, that it will lead to conflict outside the system that reshapes the system fundamentally. And what I think we are seeing is that, in fact, the system is adapting, not that there is a conflict outside the system that's leading to the birth of a new system. So I think uh, some of what Morgenthau's predictions would be are actually actually not playing out the way he would have expected. The second question you raise is a really interesting one, and it's one I don't have a perfect answer to, uh, but that is, what about preference change? How much of this is uh, really, you know, this is China's preference today versus where the system is headed? And I, in an effort to try to cover uh, five different fields of international law, 10 <laughs> countries in you know, one law review article, did not provide a fundamental theory of preference change. I do talk a little bit about preference generation. And what I'm really looking for when I come up with sovereignty legitimacy is not to say that Russia you know, has a preference for sovereignty, but rather to say that sovereignty um, is a kind of legal term of art that reflects what we can identify as some underlying preferences. Are those going to change? They may. Um, I don't think the multi-hub structure changes because of that, but the tension points may shift. Uh, I think those preferences, if they are going to change, are sticky, and so that what we have here is a useful way of understanding what maybe we're looking at over the next 10 to 15 years. Certainly, China's preferences will change. China's preferences in international economic law have already changed, right? And that's this third generation of bilateral investment treaties and the move toward the uh, negative uh, list with the United States, that's a preference change. And what, why did it happen? It happened because suddenly China has become uh, a major capital exporter uh, and is thinking about the world differently. So there will be preference change. But I think that what I'm trying to do is at least identify some preferences that will be sticky um, and that will help us see where the system's going over the next 10 to 15 years Sure, we could try to project out, and there I would look to a variety of political science theories, and you know, I personally tend to look at liberalism, and I'm going to try to figure out where the Chinese or Indian people are likely to be, uh, you know, what their interests are going to be, and how those are going to be articulated uh, through government structures. Uh, constructivists might say they're even st these preferences are stickier than I think they are. So uh, I don't have a long-term model. I have a mid-term model. Anybody in the back? Uh, well. Or a student in the middle? Yeah. Hi. Um, so thank you again. This was very good. Um, sometimes the BRICS acronym includes South Africa, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. I'm wondering to what extent you think we should sort of count them in or count them out um, of, of all of this. Yeah. Kind of so um, Larry caught me as I was starting with a, uh, a, a an error in my title, which is that I used this PowerPoint not too long ago where somebody wanted the BRICS word in there, and I put it in there. I actually try to not use the BRICS term. Um, not because I don't think it's helpful, but because I think you're right. Sometimes I want to include South Africa, sometimes I want to include Nigeria, and sometimes I want to include Mexico. What I'm talking about is a multi-hub structure, where lots of different countries at different times can and do play a big role. And I think some will say it's the BRICS plus the N11, or the BRICS plus the, you know, the, whatever number you want to play with. Um, South Africa in, is specific. Um, I think sometimes is a player and sometimes it's not, right? Um, when South Africa was sitting in the Security Council uh, on, on <laughs> Libya, it had a big voice. Um, I would argue that on some uh, you know, human rights issues, South Africa is able to have a lot of influence. On other issues, if I want to know who in Africa is going to have a voice on it, I might be looking at Nigeria uh, on energy issues, right? So uh, what I think is important is that we don't lock in any particular vision 
of which states are going to be important, but actually look at the underlying power dynamics to see who's having influence. And ultimately, in some ways, my view of this system is relatively positive precisely because I see a world that remains flexible. And if instead you lock in one particular structure, it's always the brick or the bricks, uh, that I think is much more dangerous both for international law and for the United States than a world of variable geometry and kind of flexibility and who's at the table on which issues. Yeah, Suzanne. So this, it's a really interesting contrast to, I don't know if you've read Nico Kreisch's. I sure have. So where he talks about what he says empirically is happening is a move away from formal structures, mm -hmm. from traditional international law, and from the state-centric model. Um, so I guess one question is about how you reconcile your position with his, yep. and whether part of the answer might be about actually specific issue areas. So you're seeing states come back in certain issue areas, but not others. And then the second question relatedly is, to me what seems absent from your argument is just the role of corporations and how that factors in. And again, yep. that gets back to the issue where, so for like the business and human rights regime, you're seeing kind of a new legal role for corporations, yep. right? And you do see that for money laundering for these other areas. Yeah, so, and I will actually add to your list, corporations, NGOs and individuals. I never once mentioned an NGO. When's the last time you had an international law talk that forgot about the NGOs? Um, so my, my answer to you is this is a very state-centric model. Um, I could do a different paper on the power shift away from the state. Um, and I've chosen not to do that. I've chosen to take a state-centric focus here. But I think that in some ways what this is a story about is the response of some of these countries that are very uncomfortable with exactly the phenomenons you just described. Um, particularly uncomfortable when those corporations are no longer agents of the state. Um, and I think we're seeing that today in Brazil with this Petrobras scandal. Petrobras trying to figure out if it's an agent of the state or a private corporation listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So um, I think some of this is in fact a response to that. Um, and I'm turning this into a book, and in the book I am doing a chapter on the non-state actors and sort of where they fit in the picture. I also think, though, um, that there are, in that multi-hub order, there are other kinds of hubs than just states. Um, and in some uh, corporations and in some international organizations actually can serve as hubs around particular issue areas. Those hubs do need to attract followers that are going to have to often be states, but that um, they do serve you know, in the system as issue driving hubs, um, and so that actually adds complexity to it. Uh, I had to take a fairly narrow slicing in order to try to be broad at the same time, but your point is well taken. And did I miss the first? Oh, Nico, Nico's view. Um, I think that uh, we're actually in a more traditional world than he does in some ways, and I think we're moving in some ways backwards towards tradition. Uh, I kind of like his model, um, but I just don't see empirically where the bricks are taking, you know, where, where these the power shifts underlying it are taking us in that direction. Yeah. Okay, so because we're apparently in the business of making your model more complicated, <laughs> um, so so how? To what extent do you want to take into account kind of the nature of governments, right? So, for just to kind of like give you give give you an example of what I mean, the U.S. still is kind of a hegemonic power in terms of military might, mm -hmm. right? The reason why that has not translated into hegemony in most other things is arguably because the U.S. is seen as a democracy. <coughs> that does not want to kind of project itself in exactly the same ways that, for example, if you imagine the Soviet Union having, having that kind of, <laughs> having that kind of agenda, you would, you would arguably see a very different international order. Mm -hmm. So given that, um, you know, the BRICS, some of these are democracies, some of these yep. are not, the reason why, why Brazil and India kind of play a, a slightly different game than China and Russia does is arguably because of the nature of their governments. Um, do you anticipate that becoming a major part of your model? Um, so the way I dealt with this in a, in a theoretical construct is to say, uh, what I want to look at is the preferences that are being articulated in the international system. And even though I agree that the nature of government will determine which domestic preferences are represented in the international system, I'm going to take the sort of billiard ball model of a state and say, let me figure out which preferences are being articulated and then trace how they're interacting with existing preferences. Your point is more subtle than that, though, which is to say that states may have particular identities in terms of how and how strongly they articulate those preferences in the international order itself, and what are you going to do about that? 
Um, and I guess I, I, I will say I haven't really taken that question into account. Um, and maybe I should, um, because I thought I had sort of solved the problem by saying I'm not going to care about you know, which preferences are represented by in, within the government. Um, I guess I would say that I collapse those two things to some degree. So as a good liberal, I'm going to say that the preferences that are articulated will already incorporate into them those identities that flow from you know, the nature of government. Uh, and so that I should be able to capture that just by looking at what is being articulated. But maybe I need to, to dig a little deeper and, and, and try to tease that out a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, how would you compare the multi-hub system or array that you see coming to the arguable multipolar system from the, that Metternich yeah. orchestrated from the Napoleonic Wars to, to World War I? Do you see another century? Do you see it uh, politically stable internationally, but you know, domestically having uh, uh, restrictive requirements as, as it may have in the 19th century? Or do you see other features that are similar or different to that era? <clears throat> Um, yeah, and uh, you have you have asked me that in a more nuanced and interesting way. I often get the how is this different from multipolar, and I have my sort of stock answer, and then you took it in a in an actually more interesting direction by thinking about some of the domestic implications and so forth, Era. But let me start with my my, my broad answer, which is to say I think it's far more flexible. Um, it is uh, far less um, uh, structurally rigid than that system in that you're going to have lots of different states and it's uh, coming into leadership roles, lots of different states following at different times, and that it won't be consistent across issues, right? So you look at that system, and even before I knew the issue, I could probably tell you what the states that mattered were going to be, uh, whereas here I think it's a much more uh, issue-specific and, in that sense, unstable structure. And to me, the question of stability flows from, does it become rigid? Uh, it, that, that, that it's, it, because it shifts all the time, there is a kind of equilibrium that flows from that. When it starts to lock in and you always have the same leaders over and over again, it will look much more like, I think, the, the system that, that you described, the, the concert or, or Mitternichian system. Um, and that scares me, right? That's if, if I look at the world that I don't want to see this come into, uh, is, is that vision. What are the domestic implications thereof is one I want to think about a little bit more um, and, and perhaps also do a better comparison of that era, which is not a side of it I've thought about. One more. Any new takers? Scared all the new takers away? Then repeat oh, customers. Uh -huh. OK, so following off of that a little bit, um, I'm wondering you know, if we are moving to a multi-hub system, why exactly the BRICS or, I mean, whatever you want to, the international teenagers, yep. I guess, if you will, would support that um, over, you know, where it, they're attacking the legitimacy of things like the G20 um, one, that they've been included in? Are they going to always have to be included in these, you know, issue hubs in order to find them actually legitimate? Um, so why would they support... Uh, so first thing to say is the BRICs don't have a lot of common interests. So I often do. That's one, another reason why I don't take them as a whole. Um, I think they will demand inclusion in uh, around those issues and regions where they see themselves having you know, interests at stake. What's different today is that they've figured out that on many issues, and certainly regionally, they don't just demand. They just create the structures. right? So they've gone and created a BRICs bank. Uh, which when I heard about it, I sort of laughed and said, that's not going to happen. And well, it's happened. Um, Brazil has done an extraordinary job creating new alternate institutional structures that it's included in, whether that's expanding Mercosil, whether it's bringing together the first summit of Latin American and Caribbean states. Uh, India has looked out and said, you know, uh, maybe we need to do something regionally. And there's a kind of regional organization here that we can reinvigorate. Uh, China has done that through reshaping ASEAN into ASEAN plus three and others where it's really got a role at the table. So what I think is going to be different is it's not just that they're going to ask for seats at the table. They're going to create structures where they do have a seat at the table and try to make those structures the relevant ones through which decisions get made. And you see this play out in the, the Eurasian 
Eurasian space between some Russian-led organizations and some Chinese-led organizations, each trying to sort of push the organization into the spaces where it can, it, it's going to be able to lead. At the same time, thinking about what are the legitimacy questions. And note on, on Russia and China, they're less concerned about legitimacy than Brazil and India. And maybe that goes back to the structural question of where they are in the system. Maybe it goes back to an identity question of what their history looks like. So we're out of time, but please join me in thanking. So thank you. Thank you.